Welcome back to another episode of the For the Property Investor podcast. And of course, it's our weekly segment of the weekly news with, of course, the only one that brings the news is Nick Bengal. Thank you, Nick. Oh, thank you, Owen. I love these chats. I'm so looking forward to it. Yes, yes. It's, uh, well, it's always exciting what's happened in the last week. But um, but before we get into the news, what's happened with um, you and your business in the last week? Well, that business you're referring to, Hunter and Scribe, is a, con- a copywriting agency that writes content for finance and property professionals throughout Australia. And one of the things we're really good at is writing award submissions. I've written many, many awards. I've also been an awards judge. So I understand how to write an award submission that's going to help you maximize your chances of success. And had some very happy news. One of our clients who is a prominent real estate agent in Canberra, his business won a very important award at the Real Estate Institute of ACT Awards. I won't reveal the specific award because I don't know if you would like me to reveal that he got some help with the submission because some people prefer to keep that under wraps. But it, was very, it was very pleasing to see uh, this guy who's built an incredible business and worked really hard and made some really uh impressive investments in marketing has reaped the rewards fantastic well 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 done um i'll I'll give you all the credit um uh seeing that uh, yeah we're not revealing who the winner is as far as i'm concerned you're the winner (laughs) Um, well that that is very kind of you i will call him today and tell him to uh, express post the trophy to me yes yes maybe at least a, a photo or a photocopy of it but, but you know what's interesting, Owen, when I do these award submissions, I, I interview the client and I really drill deeply into their business. And it's really interesting to me as a business owner to get this look at other people's businesses, especially the businesses of successful people. And as I say, this guy has built a really impressive business. And I learned a lot from the conversations and I was just so impressed by the things he's done. What, what's interesting about this guy, and it's about this might sound like I'm criticizing him. I'm not. He's uh, he, he's not a genius. I, I don't mean he's an idiot. He's not an idiot by any means. He, he's not a genius, though. And the reason I mention that is you can build an incredible business without being a genius. He's certainly smart and he's got a lot of common sense, but his success has come from working hard and aiming high and investing in himself and his business, and he deserves all the success he's achieved. Yes, it's uh, it's always the people who keep plugging away. They're consistent, stay consistent, and um, it's uh, and they're doing the business for the right reasons. Um, it's uh, the old saying about the tortoise does end up mm. um, winning the race. And how have things gone over the past week with you and Leafield? Oh, same, same for us. Just um, um, busy with, uh, well, it was end of month last week, so that's always a busy week, um, answering questions and uh, and because everyone likes to get paid at um, end of month. Um, And um, there's always questions after that, but uh, getting new business coming in and um, uh, looking at how we can um, um, get more people into our business. So, um, as we're expanding, we we're employing more people as well. So um, yeah, um, lots of fun and games. Mm, well, I, I know end of month is always really really busy for you, and it must feel like oh great, that's over with. I've just had a look at my calendar, and it turns out there's an end of month at the end of this month also. <laughs> yes, I know it comes around at the end of every month. It's just like geez, if we only knew. Yes. Uh, so you got it over with uh, for now, uh, but there's another one coming. Yes, yes, which is fine. We it, it is something to look forward to because it's uh, um, it's when everyone gets paid, including us. So um, we like to be um, be planned and um, uh, get everyone um, the money they deserve. Well, that sounds very nice, and I and need forward- more importantly. Well, as a property investor myself, I always like getting paid. Yes. 
So, um, Nick, what's in the news this week? We've got three stories as always. And the first one is Victoria unveils plan for better communities. After mm. consulting with the community, the Victorian government has released its new plan for Victoria, which contains eight big ideas. They are more homes in locations with great public transport access, more housing options for all Victorians, including social and affordable homes, more jobs and opportunities closer to where you live, more options for how we move from place to place, more certainty and guidance on how places will change over time, more trees and urban greening in our parks and community space, more protections from flooding, bushfire and climate hazards, and greater protection of our agricultural land. Oh, and as I'm going through these eight ideas that occurs to me, those eight ideas are motherhood statements in the sense that it's hard to see how anyone could oppose them. So the question mm. then is how to achieve them. Uh, now, just speaking generally, not about Melbourne or Victoria specifically, the first idea is to have more homes in locations with great public transport access. So what do our capital cities need to do to ensure there are more homes in locations with great public transport access? Well, yes, and every um, every major city is always trying to build more around um, current um, public transport um, hubs. and. Um, and as they're building more public transport, um, they're putting the planning in place to build more high density living around those areas. Uh, we've seen that in the um, uh, with with the metro in Sydney, with how that's been built, and what were, what used to be um, cow pastures just a few years ago, now suddenly there's a metro station, and then there's blocks of units and apartments going up. Um, so it's um, it's something that uh, our governments have always done. So it's not really anything new. Well, I'm wondering, do we need to, if we want to live, if we want to have communities with great public transport access, do we need dense communities? Do we need to build up and have lots of accommodation near train stations, metro stations, and bus stations? Well, yes. I mean, the higher density living uh, makes more sense around public transport um, hubs um, because then you 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 don't need as many cars uh, if you're living in a unit or an apartment, um, and uh, which means that you can take advantage of um, public transport. Um, so uh, uh, the the only issue in in the larger established cities. Um, is um, where before there's been public transport, sort of um, train stations, for example, um, in nice uh, uh, leafy suburban areas where um, um, nice big houses, uh, the the residents of those areas, uh, you know, turn into nimbies where they 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 don't want these, um, you know, not in my backyard, you know, they don't want these blocks of units built uh, around there. They're, they're lovely train stations that they can walk to and, um, you know, we, without um, um, having all of these blocks of units around them. So it's, um, uh, yes, communities need to understand that uh, progress needs to happen. Uh, we all live in a in a larger society and uh, we, we need this, um, and it doesn't make sense to build uh, public new public transport uh, for, uh, infrastructure just so that you can build um, uh, high density living around them. You might as well take advantage of existing infrastructure. That makes sense. Uh, kind of, and that relates to another question I want to ask you. Another one of the big ideas in the new plan for, for Victoria is that there should be more housing options, including social and affordable homes. So what do we need to do to ensure we have more housing options in our capital cities? Yes, and governments with these motherhood statements of more sociable, social and uh, affordable housing um, is, is great. No, no one can, can really um, argue with that, but what does that mean? And um, yes, the definition of... of um, more social and affordable housing. Um, it's it's been it's been tried. It's um, they're still trying, 
And it's just like, well, what does that mean? Um, how do we do that? Uh, all for it, but we need to have it planned out properly. Um, it's uh, at the end of the day, we need we need more supply um, to be able to make everything more affordable um, and to prevent uh, the existing housing supply to not go up in price as as much due to the high demand. Well, speaking of supply, let's look at that from another angle with our next story. Property listings rise 7.9%. Large numbers of new listings have come onto the market, according to SQM research. Across Australia, a total of 249,523 properties were listed for sale in August, which was 7.9% higher than the month before and 11.1% higher than the year before. In monthly terms, Listings rose in every capital city. Sydney had a 14.7% month-on-month increase, Melbourne 12.2%, Canberra 10.7%, Perth 10.6%, Adelaide 9.1%, Brisbane 7.3%, Hobart 4.1%, and Darwin 0.7%. Also, five of the eight capital cities recorded more listings in August than the same time the year before. Owen? Why do you think more properties have come onto the market, not just in month-on-month terms, but also year-on-year terms? Um, yes, well, the, it, there is the, the the spring rush, which is um, traditional, um, coming into August, September. Um, but also there's been a lot of people holding off selling in the last year or so, wanting to wait until interest rates um, you know, decide to do what they, they, they're going to do up or down or, or indifferent. Um, but I think the indifference has um, now caused people to uh, make a decision about um, uh, selling and getting on the market. And um, they're not going to get the prices that they were hoping for, um, you know, six or 12 months ago. So it's just like, okay, let's bite the bullet and um, get on the market now. Uh, and, and then there's the um, amount of people who might be hurting from this sustained higher interest rates um, and with more fixed rates coming off into variable as well, it's um, it's uh, pushing more people to decide to sell. Hmm. And with more properties coming onto the market, how do you think the vendors who are selling, how do you think they'll respond to that? And I'm wondering also, how do you think they should respond? Yes, well, that, that that's a that's a difficult um, one to answer because it depends on each individual's um, circumstances and what they're trying to achieve. Um, it's um, what it, we see that is happening is uh, there's still the same number of buyers out there. There's not an increase in 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 demand. Um, so what we're seeing is is slightly more of a buyer's market at the moment and that might continue for for the next six months and it's uh, and that will start to put downward pressure if we're not already starting to see it it it, it will put downward pressure on prices um and um how vendors should uh, should uh, react well again that's down to their individual situation um but if someone wants to get sold quickly um, then it, it always comes down to price. So um, if we start to have a, a slightly, uh, if we're looking to have a drop in the market, then we need to get under that drop quickly if we want to sell uh, as soon as possible. Mm, you, you reminded me of a conversation I've had with many real estate agents over the years where they tell me something like, uh, Nick, you know, if I had a dollar for every time I had a conversation with a client where, For example, the agent appraises the home at a million dollars and then the client says, oh, but Owen, I really need 1.1, as if the market cares what you need. Yeah, I know. It's uh, the market is the market and some people don't like what the market is telling them. And um, who do you have to blame? It's it's the person delivering the message. Mm, Yes, which can be tough, I guess, whether you're an agent or a property manager. All an agent or a property manager can do, though, is provide the client with the best possible information so the client can make an informed decision. And then I think it's important for 
the client to make a decision based on facts rather than emotion. Yes, but um, all of that's uh, part of the difficult process of trying to sell a house. With our final story, Owen, we've got something very, very different. NAB updates its clawback policy. Good news for mortgage brokers after NAB improved its clawback policy, according to the advisor. Previously, NAB clawed back 50% of the broker's commission if the broker refinanced away from NAB during the second year of the loan. Now that clawback will start at 50% in the second year, but then reduce by 4% each month. Currently, all of the big four banks have 100% clawback in the first year, reduced clawback in the second year, and 0% clawback at some point between 19 and 25 months. Oh, and you used to be a broker, and of course, you, you've got a, a lot of uh, friends and, and referral partners who are brokers. Mm. What, what do you think about clawback? Is it fair? Should clawback exist in some form? Um, oh, there, there's definitely an argument for it. Um, it's, um, but is it, is it necessary? Um, no, I, I, I don't think it is. It's, um, it's, it's a way for banks to recover their costs. Um, but you know, how did they do that when, when, when a bank employee writes the loan and they have all of those fixed costs with, um, with employees um, rather than paying a broker and and all the marketing costs for getting a, a direct to bank customer and so on but then they lose one of those customers to to another bank I mean what's the difference so it just doesn't add up or I, you know why it makes sense so it's um, uh, it, it's just another way for for the banks to be able to blame brokers. It's just like, oh, well, they're just churning the loans. So that that's why they first brought it in to stop churning. Um, and um, yeah, there's there's uh, one way of taking care of that, and it's like not have so much of an upfront payment and have more more uh, a higher trail payment. Um, but the the banks did themselves in a number of years ago by reducing. The, the the trail income um, that was there. So yeah, they, they can't have their cake and eat it, eat it too. So but well, you, we're talking about banks. <laughs> you, you've kind of anticipated something I wanted to run by you. I, I remember at National Finance Brokers Day last year, uh, I heard loan market executive chairman Sam White give a really interesting keynote address. And he made the point that if lenders did eliminate clawback, it wouldn't be free lunch for brokers because lenders would probably reduce commissions at the same time. Would that be a fair trade-off in your opinion? Um, maybe to some point, but um, it's, um, yeah, it, it's, I, I don't think either is fair. Yeah, they might need to do that, but it's uh, maybe on the upfront, but they should increase the trail payment. Hmm. It's, um, yeah, it, it, it's, uh, again, they need to explain in the first instance what the difference is between a uh, a bank written loan by an employee um, and a broker written loan and how they can justify clawbacks to begin with. I'm wondering... Uh... Would you like the government to intervene? Do you think the government should intervene and tell lenders, all of you should eliminate clawback and all of you should charge X percent upfront commission and Y percent trail commission? Or should it be left to the free market to decide? Um, well, there already has been some element of um, government regulation with it. Um, you know, when they, when they uh, knocked out the um, early termination fees, um, for the consumer. Um, and that was the bank's excuse to bring in clawbacks or to at least increase clawbacks. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I think a happy medium would be to uh, not bring in the 100% clawback uh, or, to, or to reduce the 100% in the first year. Um, it, it's, it, it's ridiculous. The, the, the broker ends up working for free to, to write the loan 
go through all of the compliance issues with writing the loan um, and they get no compensation um, for um, for bringing this customer as a site you know it and, and then what's going to happen is the consumer is going to end up getting charged a upfront fee by the broker which many uh, brokers do do so but that might become more prevalent and uh, uh, and then that will be something that the banks will take advantage of and go oh well you you're all starting to charge a fee to the um to to the customer now so we don't have to pay you as much mm-hmm. i so yeah I, I i really do think it's unfair that brokers have to suffer callback they work hard they originate the business for the lender and then through no mm. fault of their own through death divorce relocation whatever uh the loan ends it doesn't happen in any other industry yeah i can imagine a situation where Someone goes to a steakhouse and orders a steak, and then six months later, they decide they want to become a vegan. So they contact the steakhouse and say, "Well, you now need to refund me the money for the steak." Uh, like it, it's just, it, it's just not fair. If, if a customer changes their mind and terminates the loan as a result, it's not the broker's fault. I just don't think clawback is fair. Yes, and uh, just just like it's not the employee's fault mm. uh, of the bank, but um, yeah, do they claw back the um, uh, the salary that they paid the uh, the employee, and, and and what about the advertising that they they did to be able to get that client? Uh, do they go back to the TV station and um, and say sorry that that we, you know uh, about five percent of the loans that we did um, as a result of that campaign, um, you know refinanced or paid out their loan early? Can we have that five percent of our money back? It's just like yeah, it doesn't work like that. No, uh, unfortunately, uh, the system is what it is, but it would be great if one day they eliminated clawback. Yes, absolutely. No, no, no arguments here. <laughs> well, on that harmonious note, Owen, thank you as always for a fantastic chat. All right. Thank you, Nick. And um, thank you, everyone, for joining us for uh, another segment of the weekly news on the for the property investor podcast and we'll be seeing you next week with more weekly news see you nick